قل هذه سبيلي أدعو إلى الله على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين. So we return back to our lecture and after finishing with the biography of the great Imam Abu Saq al-Fazari from the Imams of the junior Atbaw Tabi'een in the area of Sham who carried on the preservation of the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu after his foremost teacher and sheikh and scholar Imam al-Awza'i the great Imam the, from the major Atbaw Tabi'een in the area of Sham now we'll progress to the, to the next level, showing the progression of this knowledge and how the Sunnah was preserved and conveyed and carried on with great Imams that have reached the highest level of trustworthiness and integrity and precision and memorization of, in the Hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu by moving to Imam Abu Mushir, Abu Mushir al-Ghassani, Abu Mushir al-Ghassani. And we will start with mentioning his name. He is also well known by his kunya, Abu Mushir. And his name is Abdul Ala, Abdul Ala ibn Mushir ibn Abdul Ala. Abdul Ala ibn Mushir ibn Abdul Ala. And his grandfather, Abdul Ala, he is well known by his kunya, Abu Zurama. Abu Zurama, Al Ghassani, Al Dimishqi. Al Dimishqi, from the city of Dimishq, Damascus in Syria. And Imam al-Zahabi, rahimahullah, in his book, Seer Alam al nubula has described him with these attributes, al-Imam. He is from the foremost scholars of the Muslims. Sheikh al-Sham, he was the foremost scholar in the area of Sham in his time. Al-Faqih, from the foremost jurists of Islam. And he is from the Tabi al -Atba. He is from the students, the level that preceded the level of the Atba tabi'in we just mentioned the progression of knowledge in Sham, Imam al awzai from the major Atbaw Tabi'een. Then his student, Imam Abu Ishaq al-Fazari, from the junior Atbaw Tabi'een. Now his student from the Tabi al Atba, Tabi Atba Tabi'een, Imam Abi Mushir. Abi Mushir. This knowledge of hadith, preserving, preserving it, collecting it, memorizing it. This was carried on in the area of Sham in succession by these great Imams of the Salaf. As far as the birth of Imam Abu Musir, he was born in the year 140 after the Hijra. In the year 140 after the Hijra. As far as his teachers and shayukh who he heard and learned hadith from and other sciences, then they are from the great scholars of the Salaf from the Atbaw Tabi'een, such as Ayyub ibn Tamim, and Sa'id ibn Abdul Aziz at Tanukhi, and Malik ibn Anas, and Sufyan ibn Uyayna, and Yahya ibn Ismail ibn Abil Muhajir, and Yahya ibn Hamza, and Ismail ibn Ayyash, and other than them. And Imam Abu Musir, Rahimullah, it is narrated upon him that he said, Qad ra'aytu al awza'i. He mentions that I have seen Imam al awzai We mentioned that Imam al awzai was from the foremost of the scholars after the Sahaba, after the Tabi'een, from the major Atbaw Tabi'een in the area of Sham, and around whom the chains of narrations of the Asanid, the chains of narrations of the Ahadith, they revolve around those chains that are Shami, those chains that are narrated by narrators from the area of Sham. In most of these chains, you will find the name of Imam al awzai Imam al awzai So the scholars of the Ahlul Hadith in, and the scholars of Hadith in Sham, they used to deem it a virtue that they met or they even saw Imam al awzai They even saw, even if they did not learn Hadith from him, even if they did not hear Hadith from him, they were not old enough to hear and preserve, memorize a Hadith from him and attend his gatherings, even just... The virtue of seeing him was something they would mention uh, that they achieved. 
So Imam Abu Musir, he was young in age when Imam al awzai passed away. He could not learn hadith from him. He could not attend his gatherings and memorize hadith from him. But he mentions that proudly that he saw that Qad ra'aytu al awzai I saw this great Imam of our region of Sham, Imam al awzai Imam Abu Musir, he says, Mata al awzai sana sab'in wa khamsin wa mi'a wa ana ibnu sab'a ashara وَكَانَ وُلِدَ لِي قَبْلَ ذَلِكْ بِعَرْبَعِينَ لَيْلَةً He says that Imam al awzai he passed away in the year, as we mentioned in his biography, in the year 157 after the Hijrah. 157 after the Hijrah. And he says that I was 17 years of age when he passed away. We just mentioned he, he was born in the year 140. So when Imam al awzai passed away in the year 157, he was only 17 years of age. He was not at that age where he could attend the gatherings of Imam al awzai and memorize hadith from him and learn hadith from him. And he said, the day that Imam al awzai passed away in the year 157, I was blessed with uh, a child 40 days before this, this uh, event or this day when Imam al awzai passed away, showing the great importance that he placed on meeting this great Imam and remembering these details that he remembers the exact age he was when he passed away the year and even that he was blessed with his first son who, or first child who was born 40 days before the death of Imam al awzai In this also is a benefit for our young brothers that these Imams of the Salaf that they married young and they had children young not like what we see in our times today where marriage is delayed especially in these times of great trials and tribulations where major sins uh, such as zina and fornication are prevalent and uh, tabarruj and women beautifying themselves and uncovering themselves is prevalent so it is befitting for the Muslims to preserve the chastity of their children and to follow the way of the Salaf in marrying them off at a young age. Al-Abbas ibn al-Walid ibn Maziyad al-Bayruti, he says, Sameetu Aba Mushirin yaqool, laqad haristu ala ilm al-awzai hatta katabtu an ibn sama'a thalatha ashara kitaban. Imam Abu Musir, as we just mentioned, he was young <coughs> and he could not hear and learn hadith from Imam al awzai even though he saw him and he considered this a great virtue for him. But when he reached the age when he could collect and learn and he treaded upon this path of seeking the hadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu he said the <coughs> persons whose hadith, whose narrations I gave the utmost of importance was Imam al awzai was Imam al awzai the Imam of his region of Sham. So he said, I traveled to his foremost students, from them Ibn Sama'a, Ibn Sama'a, who is Ismail Ibn Abdullah Ibn Sama'a. He is from the foremost students of Imam al awzai who spent several years in his company, learning hadith from him and gathering and collecting his hadith and memorizing and preserving it. So he said, I traveled to him and I wrote from him. I learned and attended his gatherings and I wrote from him 13 books in which I filled the ahadith of Imam al-Awzai showing the great diligence he placed in collecting the ahadith of this great Imam, Imam al-Awzai 13 books he filled up from the ahadith of Imam al-Awzai that he heard from his former student Imam Ibn Sama'a Hatta laqeetu abaka al-walid fa wajadtu indahu ilman lam yakun inda al-qawm so Imam Abu Musir, he is telling Al-Abbas ibn al-Walid ibn Maziyad that after I had written these 13 books and I thought that I had collected all the hadith of Imam al awzai that he had narrated, I met your father, Al-Walid ibn Maziyad. Al-Walid ibn Maziyad, he is telling this to his son Al-Abbas. He is saying, until I met your father. When I met your father, Al-Walid ibn Maziyad, I found with him a hadith uh, that he heard from Imam al awzai that I did not find with anyone else that he not, did not find with anyone else. So he even compiled and collected and memorized those ahadith. Those ahadith showing how the preservation of hadith and the knowledge of hadith progressed.
from Imam al awzai to his students to Imam Abu Musher. To Imam Abu Musher and the great efforts he made and him striving in collecting the hadith of the foremost Imam of that region around whom the chains of narrations revolve. Imam Ibn Sa'ad, Rahimullah, he says, Kana rawiyat li Sa'id ibn Abdul Aziz wa ghayrihi min al -shamiyin. That Imam Abu Musir, he strove himself and exerted in collecting the ahadith in the area of Sham from the great scholars of hadith in that area, such as his foremost teacher and Shaykh, Sa'id ibn Abdul Aziz at Tanukhi. We just mentioned him from being his teachers and sheikhs, and we'll also mention him soon, inshallah, and mention some details about him, that Imam Abu Musa strove to collect his hadith, the hadith of this great Imam Sa'id ibn Abdul Aziz at Tanukhi, and other scholars of, of Sham, thereby playing a major role in preserving uh, the hadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu in the area of Sham in those times. As far as his students, then the great Imams of Hadith, then they narrated hadith from him, heard hadith and learned from hadith from Imam Abu Musir, such as Yahya ibn Ma'in, Yahya ibn Ma'in, and Ahmed ibn Hanbal, and Duhim, and Abu Zura al-Dimishqi, and Muhammad ibn Yahya al-Zuhli, and Imam al-Bukhari, and Imam Ishaq ibn Mansur al-Kawsaj, and Imam al-Darimi, the author of the book Musnad, or the Sunan al-Darimi, and Imam Abu Hatim al-Razi, and other than them from the great Imams, foremost Imams of the Ahlul Hadith of, of Hadith and the Sciences. They were all students of Imam Abu Mus'ir, Abdul Ala Al-Ghassani. <coughs> as far as the statements of the scholars in praise of this great Imam Abu Mus'ir, especially in Hadith and the Sciences, then we have the statement of Imam Yahya ibn Ma'in, one of his foremost students. He says, Alladhi yuhadith bi balad. Bihi man huwa awla bit-tahdithi minhu ahmaq. He says that whoever puts himself forth to narrating a hadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to conveying, relaying, and transmitting them, teaching them in a, in a place, in a locality, in a country where there is someone who is above him, who is more deserving due to his preciseness and accuracy in memory, the one who is lesser than him, who puts himself forth for this, then he is a ahmaq. He is an ignorant person. He is an ignorant person. Rather, preference should be given to the one who is of a higher level in his preciseness and memory. He should be given precedence, not someone who is lesser than him. The one who puts himself forth when he has not reached that level, then he is a foolish person. وَإِذَا رَأَيْتَنِي أُحَدِّثُ بِبَلَدٍ فِيهَا مِثْلُ أَبِي مُسْهِرْ فَيَنْبَغِي لِلِحْيَةِ أَنْ تُحْلَقْ Imam Yahya ibn Ma'in continues by giving an example of this by saying if you were to see me Imam Yahya ibn Ma'in the Imam of Jarwa Ta'adil the Imam of create, criticizing, praising narrators he's saying that if you were to see me narrating hadith putting myself forward to narrate and teach and convey a hadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu in a locality, in a place where Imam Abu Musir exists then know that my beard is deserving of being shaved off as punishment. My beard is deserving of being shaved off as punishment, showing the great status Imam Abu Musher had near this great Imam Yahya ibn Ma'in. Imam Yahya ibn Ma'in, he also says, مَا رَأَيْتُ مُنذُ خَرَجْتُ مِنْ بِلَادِ أَحَدًا أَشْبَعَ بِالْمَشْيَخَةِ الَّذِينَ أَدْرَكْتُهُمْ مِنْ أَبِي Musher. He says, and Imam Yahya ibn Ma'in, as we'll mention in his biography, inshallah, he had a vast rihla, a vast journey for seeking and collecting the ahadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says that in this vast journey of mine, since I left my city and locality in this journey, I never met anyone from the scholars I met who I heard hadith from, the shiukh who I learned and attended the gatherings, who was most deserving of teaching and narrating uh, and conveying the hadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam than Abu Mushir, than the great Imam Abu Mushir. <coughs> imam Abu Dawood al-Sajistani, the author of the book al-Sunan, he says, Sameetu Ahmad ibn Hanbal yaqul, Rahim Allah Abu Mushir, ma kana asbatahu, wa ja'ala yutrihi, 
that Imam Abu Dawood al-Sistani said that I heard my Shaykh and teacher Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal saying regarding his Shaykh and teacher Imam Abu Musir remembering him after he passed away by saying may Allah have mercy upon Imam Abu Musir how precise was his memory how strong and exact and correct and precise was his memory وَجَعَلَ يُطْرِيهِ Imam Abu Dawood says and he continued to praise Imam Abu Musir continued to Praise him with great praises. Imam Abu Zura al Dimishki, he says, Qala li Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Indakum thalasatun ashabu hadith, Al Walid wa Marwan ibn Muhammad wa Abu Mushir. Imam Abu Zura al Dimishki, he says that Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal told me that you have three people who are the foremost scholars of hadith in your region of Sham. Three are the foremost scholars of hadith in the region of Sham. Who are they? Al-Walid, meaning Al-Walid ibn Muslim. <coughs> Al-Walid ibn Muslim. And Marwan ibn Muhammad. Marwan ibn Muhammad al-Asadi. And Imam Abu Mushir. And Imam Abu Mushir. Imam Abu Mushir, rahimullah, he says, Kataba ilayya Ahmad ibn Hanbal. لِأَكْتُبَ إِلَيْهِ بِحَدِيثِ أُمِّ حَبِيبَ فِي مَسْأَ الْفَرْجِ Showing the great status Imam Abu Musir had near Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal That Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal himself wrote a letter to Imam Abu Musir To write back to him with the hadith that he had memorized and preserved on, uh, From the chain or narrating upon Ummu Habiba رضي الله عنها regarding Breaking of the wudu by way of one touching his private part. By way of one touching his private part. And it is an authentic hadith that Imam Ibn Majah has narrated uh, in his sunan on the authority of Umm Habiba radiallahu anha in which he said that the Prophet sallallahu he said man masa farjahu falyatawadda that whoever touches his private part without any shield then let him repeat his wudu. This breaks his wudu and let him make wudu again. So Imam Ahmad, this hadith was not in his position. So he requested from Imam Abu Mushir to write this hadith to him. So uh, he can hear it and collect it from this great Imam, Imam Abu Mushir. Imam Abu Mushir, he says, قَالَ لِي سَعِيدِ بْنُ عَبْدُ الْعَزِيزِ مَا شَبَّحْتُكَ فِي الْحِفْظِ إِلَّا بِجَدِّكْ أَبِي ذُرَامَ ما كان يسمع شيء إلا حفظه. Imam Abu Musir he says that my teacher and scholar and Sheikh Saeed ibn Abdul Aziz at Tanuki. He says <coughs> he said regarding his preciseness in memory and his ability in retaining the ahadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He said that I have never seen. Anyone more precise in his memory than you and your memory, he told his student Abu Musa that, that your memory is similar to the memory of your grandfather, of your grandfather Abu Zurama. Abu Zurama, whose name was Abdul Allah, as we just mentioned, his, his grandfather was well known by this kunya, Abu Zurama. How was the memory of his grandfather that he's linking his memory to? That he did not used to hear anything except that he memorized it. He did not used to hear anything except that he instantly memorized it. Such was the strength and capacity of memorization of Imam Abu Mushir. Imam Abu Mushir, he says, كان سعيد ibn Abdul Aziz يدانيب الأوزاي Dad, Saeed, my teacher, Saeed ibn Abdul Aziz, At-Tanukhi, rahimahullah, he used to deem me to be close in status, in virtue, in memorization, in preservation of the hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu to Imam Al-Awza'i, to Imam Al-Awza'i. Abu Al-Jamahir, Muhammad Ibn Uthman, he says, Ma ra'aytu bisham misal Abi Mushir. He says that I did not see at that time in the vast region of Sham, anyone who was close, anyone who resembled Imam Abu Mushir. In the great Imam Abu Hatim al-Razi, Rahimullah, he says, مَا رَأَيْتُ أَحَدًا فِي كُورَةٍ مِنَ الْكُورِ 
اعظم قدرا ولا اجل عند اهلها من ابي مصحر بدمشق he says and imam abu hatim also as we'll discuss in his biography inshallah that he has an extremely vast journey and travels that he undertook in collecting and compiling and preserving the ahadith of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said that the vast regions and lands and cities and countries that i ent- entered and traveled to and the scholars i met i never entered any country and locality whose scholar was more beloved and held in high regard near them than abu mushar abu mushar near the people of sham near the people of sham of damascus of damascus the capital of of present day syria he says what he saw he is narrating what he saw in this travels of his he says كنت ارى ابا مسهر اذا خرج الى المسجد استفى الناس له يمنى ويسرى يسلمون عليه he said that i saw that if abu musher he would leave his house to go to the masjid for the prayers the people would line up waiting for him to walk to go from his house to the masjid on the right and the left so that they could just shake his hand so that they could just shake his hand and give salam to him to give salam to him showing the great status and high regard this great imam abu musher was held in in his city and locality in the area of sham near its people then we'll move on to some aspects of uh, the life of this great imam and some of the incidents that occurred with him and we'll focus on just one incident one incident that shows the great struggle that this imam went through and the great trial and tribulation he had to be patient upon and the great service he presented to the muslims in this trial and tribulation and this was a great trial and tribulation that afflicted the muslim nation and the great scholars of the salaf and the ahlul hadith and the ahlus sunnah at that time and this was the trial of the trial and tribulation of the mu'tazila the trial and tribulation of the mu'tazila and especially during the time of the seventh caliph from the caliphs of the abbasid dynasty al-mamun al-mamun ali ibn uthman al-nufayli he says kunna ala bab abi mushir jama'atan min ashab al-hadith fa marida fa'udnahu wa qulna kayfa asbahta qala fi afiyatin radiyan 'an Allah sakhitan ala dhil qarnain kayfa lam yaj'al saddan bainana wa baina ahli al-iraq kama ja'alahu baina ahli khurasan wa baina yajuj wa majuj ali ibn usman al-nufayli he says that we the students of hadith we reached the entrance of the residence of imam abu mushir to visit him after he had gotten sick he had gotten sick so we we came to his door to his residence to visit him so when we entered upon him we said kayfa asbahta how are you feeling now so he said alhamdulillah i'm feeling better i am pleased with allah azza wa jal and i am upset with dhul qarnain and i'm upset with dhul qarnain how did he not make between us and the people of iraq a dam just like he made a dam between the yajuj and jamajuj and the people of khurasan showing the great trials and tribulations that were afflicting the muslims from the region of iraq in those times the seat of the abbasid dynasty as we will mention that that officially accepted the belief of the mu'tazila so he said i am upset with him that he did not make a dam a barrier between us and the region of iraq and the people of iraq who have caused a great trial and tribulation for us as he made a dam and a barrier between yajuj and majuj and the people of khurasan and the people of khurasan and this is one of the statements of the scholars as a side benefit regarding the region where uh, this dam or barrier lies and where yajuj and majuj have been sealed be- behind this dam and barrier some of the scholars have mentioned that this is a region of khurasan region of khurasan which is today in central asia which is today in central asia then he says 
فما كان بعد هذا إلا يسيرا حتى وافى المامون دمشق ونزل بدير مران وبنى القبة فوق الجبل فكان بالليل يعمر بجمر عظيم فيوقد ويجعل في تصوت كبار تدلع من عند القبيبة بسلاسل وحبال فتدي له الغوطة فيبصرها بالليل در a little after Imam Abu Musher said the statement regarding the people of Iraq and the trials and tribulations that have afflicted them from Iraq a few days passed away uh, passed by until Mamun the caliph of the Muslims at that time he came to Damascus Damascus the capital of Syria he visited Damascus from from Iraq from Baghdad where the seat of the Abbasid dynasty lied and he took up residence in a, in a, in a small town called Deir, Deir Murran. Deir Murran. And it is still known by this day today. And it, it is a small town at the, at the foundation of the great mountain Qasiyun. Qasiyun, which is a great mountain that overlooks the city of Damascus. That overlooks the city of Damascus. So... Al Mamun, he took up residence in this in this town at the bottom of the mountain, at the foot of the mountain, and he built a big dome on top of the mountain, on top of mountain Qasiyun. And at night, he would burn or he would order with the burning of a large amount of coal in that dome on top of the mountain, large amount of coal on top of the mountain. And this coal was, pres was placed in big vessels, large vessels, and they would be moved and shaked by chains and ropes until they would light up into fire. They would light up into fire and it would light up the area of Al Ghuta, area of Al Ghuta, which is a well known area, which is a a suburban or a countryside area of Damascus that surrounds the city of Damascus until today it is known by the same name Al Ghuta it's a countryside suburban area that surrounds the city of area so he would do this every night so that it, it, this area would light up with the burning coal that occurred at the top of the mountain Qasiyun because they did not have electricity at that time this was one of the ways that they would light up uh, a place فَيُبْسِرُهَا bil So that he could see al ghuta at night. So that he could see the area of al ghuta at night. وَكَانَ لِأَبِي مُسْرِ حَلَقَ فِي الْجَامِعِ بَيْنَ الْعِشَائِينَ In the height of Sharqi. فَبَيْنَ هُوَ لَيْلَ إِذْ قَدْ دَخَلَ الْجَامِعِ دَوْنْ عَظِيمِ فَقَالَ أَبُو مُسْرِ مَا هَذَا قَالُوا النَّارَ الَّتِي تُدَلَّ مِنَ الْجَبَلِ لِأَمِيرِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ That he, when this one night, Imam Abu Musir was in his gathering in Al Jami, and Al Jami, when it is mentioned in uh, regarding Damascus in Syria, then it only means one Jami, which is Al Jami Al Umawi, Al Jami Al Umawi, the Grand Mosque that the Umayyad dynasty built. So he had a gathering of knowledge, gathering of hadith between the two Ishas, between Maghrib and Isha, in Al Jami Al Umawi near the eastern. Eastern side or the eastern pillar of this of this great mosque. So he was teaching the students of Hadith one night. Suddenly, where an extremely bright light entered the mosque, extremely bright light that blinded them entered the mosque. So Imam Abu Musir he said, "What is this? What is happening?" So the students informed him that this is the fire, the fire from top of the mountain Qasiyun that is being burned for Amirul Mu'minin, for the leader of the Muslims, uh, Al-Mamun. So that he could see Al-Ghuta, so that he could see the area of Al-Ghuta, Hatta tudi lahu Al-Ghuta. Faqala, so upon hearing this, Imam Abu Musa recited this ayah, recited this statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, Atabnuna bi kulli ri'in ayatan ta'abathun wa tattakhidhuna masani'a la'allakum takhludun. He recited this ayah that why do you build a, a landmark? Why do you build a landmark on every high place? On every high place in vain. 
and construct castles in every high place. Construct castles in every high place as if you are going to live forever. As if you are going to live forever. وَكَانَ فِي الْحَلْقَ صَاحِبْ خَبَرْ لِلْمَامُونَ فَرَفَعَ ذَلِكَ لِلْمَامُونَ when Imam Abu Musa recited this ayah, there was a spy of Mamun in that gathering. So he informed Mamun with what Imam Abu Musa has said. فَحَقَدَهَا عَلَيْهِ فَلَمَّا رَحَلَ الْمَامُونَ أَمَرَ بِحَمْلَ أَبِي مُسْهِرْ إِلَيْهِ فَمْتَحَنَهُ بِالرَّقَّةِ فِي الْقُرْآنِ So when this spy informed Mamun with what Imam Abu Musa has said, he started from that same day to dislike him and, despise, and be displeased with him. Despise him and dislike him. When Maimun, he left back or he traveled from, uh, from Damascus, he ordered that Imam Abu Musa be, bring, be brought to him in the city of Ar-Raqqa. In the city of Raqqa, which is also a city in Syria. And there he tested him with the Quran. There he tested him. Imam, there Imam Abu Musir was tested by Mamun with the Quran. With the Quran. And what is this test that occurred? This is the test that Mamun tested the great scholars of the Salaf and the, of the Ahlul Hadith, Ahlul Sunnah of that time with the belief of the Mu'tazila that the Quran is makhluk. That the Quran is created. That the Quran is created. The belief of Ahlul Sunnah, Ahlul Hadith, as we just mentioned, is that the Quran is the speech of Allah, Kalamullah, Ghayru Makhluq. It is not created. It is a speech of the Creator. It is an attribute of Allah Azza wa Jal. It is not, it is not created. And whoever believes any attribute of Allah Azza wa Jal, the Creator, is created, then he is a disbeliever. He is a disbeliever by the consensus of the Muslims, by the consensus of the Muslims, whoever believes that the Quran is makhluk, that it is created, then he has declared that the Quran is not the speech of Allah. Then it is not the speech of the creator and by way of this he has disbelieved according to the consensus of the Muslims. And the Salaf, the Imams of the Salaf are all united in this belief, are all united in this belief. And before we go on, we would like to just present a, a historical uh, overview of this misguided sect of the Mu'tazila. This misguided deviant sect of the Mu'tazila, they came into existence at the end of the Umayyad dynasty. At the end of the Umayyad dynasty, in the beginning of the second century after the Hijrah. In the beginning of the second century, in the hundreds after the Hijrah in the city of Basra. In the city of Basra and the one to whom the founding of this misguided sect and deviant group is attributed to is Wasil ibn Ata. Wasil ibn Ata, who lived in the city of Basra, he at first was a student of hadith, attending the gatherings of the foremost scholar of Basra at that time from the Tabi'een, Imam al Hassan al Basri, who is known as Sayyid al Tabi'een, the leader of the Tabi'een. But Allah Ta'ala willed that he be misguided, he followed his desires and he started to negate the attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal and the foremost of them, the speech of Allah Azza wa Jal to the point that he distanced himself from the gatherings of Imam al Hassan al-Basri Imam al Hassan al-Basri so Imam al Hassan al-Basri upon seeing this he said اِتَزَلَنَا wasil that wasil has shunned us and he has left us so this sect and this belief became to be known as the Mu'tazila. This is the reason for this name. Those who have shunned and left and, and, and distanced themselves. This is the reason for this, the name of this sect. And this sect started to spread in Basra and in the area of Iraq. Wasil ibn Ata had his companions and his students who would take this responsibility of spreading this misguided beliefs of this sect. And a lot of these innovators and the, and the leaders of this sect were, alhamdulillah, they were killed by the rulers of the Muslims of that time. 
to save the Muslims from the great evil and the, this, and the misguided belief, such as Al-Jad ibn Dirham. Al-Jad ibn Dirham, who was from the foremost of the innovators of this sect, he was killed at the end of the Umayyad dynasty. Then his student, Al-Jaham ibn Safwan, Al-Jaham ibn Safwan, who also created a subsect from the Mu'tazila, which is known as Jahmiya, which is known as Jahmiya. He was also, Alhamdulillah, caught and punished and killed by the Muslim rulership at that time to protect the Muslims from this deviated, misguided belief. And others from them were also caught and killed. The remaining, they, they worked under, under darkness and in shadows amongst the laymen and the ignorant, spreading this, this belief and this misguidance until Mamun came into power. Until Mamun, the seventh caliphate of the Abbasid dynasty, he came to power in the year 198. 198 after the Hijrah. And Mamun, this is his nickname. These rulers, they had nicknames. His name is Abdullah ibn Harun. He is the son of Harun al-Rashid. He is the son of Harun al-Rashid, Abdullah ibn Harun. And he is known, well known by his nickname, Al-Mamun. When he came into power in the year 198, he became the ruler of the Muslims. He was someone who loved uh, intellectual sciences. Someone who loved intellectual sciences and he loved the, the speech of the philosophers of, of previous times. He was someone who loved the speech of the philosophers of previous times and he established a complete uh, research house for translating the books of Greek philosophy into the Arabic language. He established a complete research house for translating the books of Greek philosophy into the Arabic language that he named Baytul Hikmah, the place of Hikmah and wisdom, the house of Hikmah. And these innovators from the Mu'tazila, they started to gain power in his time. They started to gain power and they come out, they started to come out from the holes and hiding and the darkness and shadows to the point that they surrounded Maimun with their beliefs and he became one of the foremost people who accepted this belief of the Mu'tazila. From the people, from these scholars of misguidance and deviation and innovation who afflicted Maimun was Bishar al-Marisi. Bishar Al-Marisi, one of the foremost figureheads of the Mu'tazila of that time. He played a major role in, in, devi in causing Mamun to accept the belief of the Mu'tazila and causing a test and trial for the scholars of the Salaf in that time. And from an amazing historical uh, aspect that we can mention is that this person, Bishar Al-Marisi, he lived his entire life hiding from Harun al-Rashid, from the father of Mamun. When Harun al-Rashid was the leader of the Muslims, he spent his entire life hiding from Harun al-Rashid because Harun al-Rashid had ruled for him to be caught and to be killed, to protect the Muslims from his deviation and misguidance, to be protect the Muslims from misguidance and deviation. He spent 40 years of his life hiding, hiding from the rulership of the Abbasid dynasty until Mamun came into power and he became the closest of the people to Mamun. To the exact son of the person who, who spent his whole life trying to catch him and to kill him. So this also in this is a benefit that a ruler, a person might come who might aid the Sunnah, that someone from his own blood, his own son might come who might be a test and trial for the people of the Sunnah and the people of the truth. And then his son or someone close to him might come who might again aid the Sunnah as we will see soon. That's Harun Rashid. He spent his life fighting and trying to ca catch this Mu'tazila. His son Mamun came who became one of the figureheads of this misguided sect and tested the people. Then his nephew came who finished off the Mu'tazila and aided the Sunnah and aided the Sunnah, uh, and this is a great uh, lesson for uh, all of us as to how 
situations uh, can change and Allah Ta'ala raises a people and uh, lowers them by way of them aiding the throat and the Quran and the Sunnah and opposing it. From the misguided beliefs of this deviant sect, the Mu'tazila, as we mentioned, the foremost is to negate the attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal. To negate the attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal. And from the foremost of these attributes that they negated is the attribute of Kalam, speech. And they said that the Quran, it is not the speech of Allah, rather it is created. Rather it is makhluk and created. From the misguided beliefs of the Mu'tazila is refuting and negating Qadr that we just mentioned. Negating Qadr. They are just like the Qadariyah in which they negate and they do not believe in pre-decree and in Qadr. From the misguided deviant, deviant beliefs of the Mu'tazila is that the, the major sinner, the, the one who commits a major sin, then in the, he in the hereafter he is a dweller of the hellfire. He is a dweller of the hellfire forever, just like the Khawarij. But in the worldly life, he is not a believer nor a disbeliever. <coughs> he is not a disbeliever or a believer. Rather, he is fi manzila baina al manzilatain. He is in a level between a believer and a disbeliever, whatever level that is. So, <coughs> these are some of the major aspects of misguidance and deviation of this of this deviant sect, the Mu'tazila. Ma'amun at first, he would he would not force the people upon this belief even though he had accepted it he did, he did not become extreme in it forcing the people until the year 218 until the year 218 after the hijrah where he started to use his power and his command and his rulership over the people to test the people and the foremost of the people who were tested were the scholars of ahlul hadith ahlul sunnah the great scholars of the Salaf of that time. No scholar lived in those times, especially in the region of Iraq, except that he was tested. Imam Ali ibn al-Madini was tested. Imam Yahya ibn Ma'in was tested. Imam, and the foremost of them was Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, as we'll mention in his biography, the great test that he endured and the strength he showed in staying steadfast in these tests in these tests and this test continued and this misguidance of the Mu'tazila continued for three successive rulers from the Abbasid dynasty Al-Mamun then his brother who came into power Al-Mu'tasim Al-Mu'tasim Billah who was Muhammad ibn Harun al-Rashid Al-Mamun we mentioned his Abdullah ibn Harun al-Rashid after he died his brother came into power Muhammad ibn Harun Rashid, who is well known as Mu'tasim Billah, he also followed upon this misguidance of the Mu'tazila. Then came his son, Al Wasik Billah. Al Wasik Billah, whose name is Harun ibn Muhammad al Mu'tasim. Harun ibn Muhammad ibn Harun al Rashid, <coughs> he also followed in this misguidance and testing the people until his brother, Al Mutawakkil al Allah. Al Mutawakkil al Allah, whose name is Ja'far ibn Muhammad ibn Harun. Ja'far ibn Muhammad ibn Harun, meaning the nephew of Al Mamun. The nephew of Mamun. The son of his brother Muhammad. The son of his brother Muhammad, Ja'far ibn Muhammad ibn Harun. He came to power in the year 232. 232 after the Hijrah, and alhamdulillah, he aided the Sunnah. He aided the Sunnah and he and he caught and severely uh, punished the Mu'tazila, aided the Sunnah and freed them from the jails and the prisons and the tests and the trials and tribulations they were going through and uh, severely caught and punished the Mu'tazila. Continuing with this test of Imam Abu Mushir, Asbugh, he says, Anna Abu Mushir dakhal ala al-mamun bil raqqa وَقَدْ دَرَبَ رَقَبَ رَجُلٍ وَهُوَ مَطْرُوهُ فَأَوْقَبَ أَبَ مُسْرِ فِي الْحَالِ فَمْتَحَنَهُ That, continuing the story, that Mamun, after hearing what he heard in Dimashq, in Damascus, he ordered that Abu Musr be brought to him in the city of Raqqa, 
in Syria, where he tested him with the Quran, with this issue of the Mu'tazila that the Quran is created. So, Azbukh, he says that Abu Musher, he entered upon Mamun in the city of Raqqa in Syria. And while he entered, when he entered, he saw that Mamun had just killed a person in front of him who had refused to believe and claim that the Quran is created. He had just killed him in front of him. So when Abu, Imam Abu Musa entered, he immediately stopped him and asked him and tested him. Asked him about the Quran. Falam yujibhu. So he did not answer him. Imam Abu Musa did not answer him. Fa'amara bihi fa'wudiya finnit li yadriba unuqahu fa'ajaba ila khalq al-Quran. That he, when, he, when he did not answer him, Mamun ordered that the nit, the nit is a, a, a sheet of leather that used to be placed under the person who was supposed to be killed. Under the person who was supposed to be uh, killed, who had been ruled upon to be killed. So Mamun ordered that this be laid down so that Imam Abu Mushir could be also punished and killed. فَأَجَابَ إِلَى خَلْقِ الْقُرْآنِ Upon seeing this, he was forced to, to answer him regarding this issue and say that the Qur'an is created. Say that the Qur'an is created. فَأُخْرِجَ مِنَ النِّتْعِ So he was exited from this uh, sheet of leather upon which he was placed to be killed. فَرَجَ عَنْ قَوْلِي As soon as he, 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 they raised him, and they removed him. He took back his statement saying the Quran is the speech of Allah. It is not created. So he, again he was laid down on the sheet of leather to be killed. So again he said the Quran is created. He was forced to say that the Quran is created. La tablughu miyat yom wa mata. So Mamun, upon seeing this, he did not accept his statement that the Quran is created. Realizing that Imam Abu Musa is only saying this out of fear and out of force. So he ordered that he be banished to Iraq, to the jails, the dungeons of the Abbasid dynasty in Baghdad, in Iraq, where the head of his Police in Iraq, Ishaq ibn Ibrahim. Ishaq ibn Ibrahim, he uh, tortured him in these cells and jails for a period of 100 years until this great Imam Abu Musir passed away. And this is great Imam Abu Musir, he passed away under this great trial and tribulation. Imam ibn Sa'ad, he says, كان Abu Musir أشخص من دمشق إلى المامون بالرقة فسألوا عن القرآن فقال هو كلام الله وأبى أن يقول مخلوق فدعا له بالنتع والسيف ليضرب عنقه فلما رأى ذلك قال مخلوق فتركه من القتل وقال أما إنك لو قلت ذلك قبل السيف لقبلت منك ولكنك تخرج الآن فتقول قلت ذاك فرقا من القتل فأمر بحسبه ببغداد في ربيع الآخر سنة ثمان وثمان عشرة ومات بعد قليل في الحبس في غرة رجب من السنة فشهده قوم كثير من أهل بغداد. إمام المسعد رحمه الله says that when Imam Abu Musir was brought from from Damascus to the city of Raqqa to be presented in front of Mamun, he asked him regarding the Quran. So Imam Abu Musir he said it is Kalamullah, the speech of Allah, and he refused to say that it is makhluk, it is created. So Al Mamun ordered that the sword and this leather sheet be brought so that Imam Abu Musir could be killed in punishment. So when Imam Abu Musir saw this, he said makhluk. He said it is created out of being forced to say so. So Mamun saved him from being killed. Mamu saved him from being killed, but he said that you have only said this out of fear of the sword, or a fear of the sword. Had you said it from the first instance, before we brought the sword and this leather sheet, I would have accepted it from you. But you say it now, after you see the sword, then you have only said it to free your life, to save your life. So he did not accept this from him, and he ordered that Imam Abu Musir be taken as a prisoner to the city of Baghdad, 
the capital, the seat of the Abbasid dynasty in the, city, in the month of Rabiul Akhir, in the month of Rabiul Akhir, in the year 218 after the Hijrah, and he passed away while in the dungeons of the Abbasid dynasty, the fourth day of Rajab, meaning almost a hundred years he spent in these jails in the first day of Rajab in the year 218. So after he passed away, a large number of people gathered for his janazah from the people of Baghdad, from the people of Baghdad, showing that no matter how much oppression and trial and tribulation uh, might be placed upon the scholars of the Sunnah and the scholars of the Salaf and the Ahlul Hadith, that the people will always love them, respect them, revere them, hold them in high regard. And this is one of the distinguishing aspects of uh, the Ahlul Hadith and Ahlul Sunnah, the Janais, the prayer of the Janaza, that people, irrespective of their uh, beliefs and their madhahib and the trials and tribulations that are going on, they gather in vast, large numbers for the Imams of the Ahlul Hadith and the Ahlul Sunnah. Imam Ishaq ibn Rahuya, he says, لما سار المامون إلى دمشق ذكروا له أبا مسهر ووصفوه بالعلم والفقه فأحضره فقال ما تقول في القرآن قال كما قال تعالى وإن أحد من المشركين استجارك فأجره حتى يسمع كلام الله Imam Ishaq ibn Rahuya, he says that when Mamun came to Dimesh, Damascus the people, he heard from the people the great praise from Imam Abu Musir the great praise for this Imam of, of, of Damascus of Sham, where they were uh, praising him for his knowledge and his fiqh and his understanding in the religion and uh, knowledge of jurisprudence. So he asked that he be brought to him. So when Mamun, when Imam Abu Musher was brought to Mamun, he asked him, What do you say regarding the Quran? What do you say regarding the Quran? So he said, I say, just as has come in the Quran, and he recited this ayah as a proof that. The Allah Ta'ala has ordered the Muslims that if anyone from the mushriks, from the disbelievers, if they were to seek your protection, then give him protection so that Hatta Yasma Kalam Allah. So that, can, that he can hear the speech of Allah, the Quran. He can hear in your houses the speech of Allah that will, might lead him to be guided to accept Islam. That might be that might lead him to be guided to accept Islam. So he used this as a ayah for the Proof of the belief that the Quran is the Kalamullah, the speech of Allah. Faqala, Maimun did not accept this from him. So he said to Imam Abu Musir, A makhlukun huwa wa ghayru makhluk. He asked him directly, Is it created or is it not created? So Imam Abu Musir responded to this ruler of all of the Muslims at that time, ruled vast. Areas of lands from the east to the west without fear. He said, Qala wa ma yaqul Amirul Mu'minin? Qala makhluk. So he asked him, and what does the ruler of the Muslims, Amirul Mu'minin, say regarding this matter? He said, makhluk, that it is created. Qala, Abu Imam Abu Musa then asked him, Yukhbir an Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam awa anis sahaba wa tabi'in? That when, when he said that, I believe it is makhluk, it is created, he said, Are you? Basing this belief on something narrated from Prophet Muhammad sallallahu or the Sahaba and the Tabi'een, a hadith or a athar, qala bin nazar, So he said, no, this is my personal analogy and personal belief. This is something I was guided to with my personal intellect. And then he started providing his intellectual proofs. Providing his intellectual proofs. Imam Abu Musa immediately stopped him. He said, faqala ya amir al-mu'mineen, nahnu ma'al jamhur al-azam. أَقُولُ بِقَوْلِهِمْ وَالْقُرْآنُ كَلَامُ اللَّهِ غَيْرُ مَخْلُوقٌ Abu Musa, rahimullah, he says, O oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, believer, O oh, leader of the Muslims, I am with the, the consensus of the scholars of Islam. I say what they say, that the Quran is the speech of Allah. It is not created. It is not created. So upon hearing this, Ma'amun said, أُخْرُجْ قَبَّحَكَ اللَّهِ وَقَبَّحَ مَنْ قَلَّدَكَ دِينَهُ وَجَعَلَكَ قُدْوَ Ma'amun upon seeing this, he said, get out. May Allah curse you and deform you. And may Allah curse the one who follows your path and takes you as an example in this belief. Takes you as an example in this belief. Musa ibn al-Hasan, rahimullah, he says, 
سمعت ابا مسحر وقد وجه به المامون الى اسحاق بن ابراهيم ببغداد فاهدر له اسحاق جماعه ليقر بكتاب المهنه الذي كتبه المامون في خلق القران ونفي الرؤيا وعذاب القبر وان الميزان ليس بكفتين that when imam abu musir was sent to the head of the police of the abbasids in in baghdad in the dungeons of the abbasids in baghdad in in iraq ishaq ibn ibrahim the head of the police he brought to imam abu musir people evil scholars who had followed desires and worldly benefits and, and sought positions with the mutazila and this oppressive uh, this uh, and answered them in this test and trials he said they brought these people to imam abu musir so that they could uh, agree they could get him to agree to what was in the book al mehna that mamun had authored mamun has al al had also authored a book a book that he called kitab al mehna a book in which he used to test the scholars of the salaf in which he had matter, mentioned matters of belief regarding which they are supposed to be tested regarding which they are supposed to be tested what was in this book it says in this book was the belief that the quran is created and that nafi ar-ru'ya that allah ta'ala will not be seen in the hereafter allah ta'ala will not be seen in the hereafter wa nafi azab al-qabr that there is no punishment of the grave wa anna al-mizan laysa bi kaffatain that the scale on which a person and his deeds will be measured on the day of judgment then it does not exist it does not have two scales it does not have two scales and all of this are from the foremost misguidance and deviance of the mu'tazila who who refuted and rejected the attributes of allah and the ahadith that have come in matters of creed and belief especially the ahad ahadith especially the ahad ahadith that are not mutawatir falamma quri al kitab ala abi musir قال انا منكر لجميع ما في كتابكم هذا when this book was read upon imam abu musir so that he could agree with what was in this book of deviance and misguidance imam abu musir without fear he said i reject everything that is in this book i reject everything that you have just recited upon me from this book abad mujalasat malik wa thawri wa mashaykh ahl al ilm idhan la akfuru billah that after sitting with the with the imams of that times from the salaf such as imam malik and imam sufyan al-thawri and the great scholars of the salaf after that do i will i disbelieve in allah azza wa jal will i choose deviance and misguidance la aqulu al-quran makhluq wa la unkir azab al-qabr wa la al-mawazina annaha kaffatan wa la anna allah yura fi al-qiyamah he says i will not disbelieve in allah i will not say that the quran is created i will not reject the punishment of the grave i will not reject the mizan upon which the person and his deeds will be measured on the day of judgment that it has two scales i will not reject that allah will be seen on the day of judgment then he added he did not just reject what was in the book and what has been recited to him he added more aspects of the belief of the salaf that he learned from the great imams of such as imam malik and sufyan al-thawri and others he say he says wala anna allah ala arshihi وعلمه علمه قد احاط بكل شيء نزل بذلك القران وجاءت به الاخبار التي نقلها اهل العلم he says and i will not deny that allah taala is upon his arsh upon his throne above the seven heavens and his knowledge is with us his knowledge has surrounded us he is his knowledge is with us and these aspects of belief have come in the quran and the authentic hadith have come in the quran in the authentic hadith that have been narrated by the utmost precise trustworthy narrators of hadith utmost precise narrators of hadith fajurra bi rijlihi wa turiha fi adyaq al majalis upon upon hearing this ishaq ibn ibrahim the head of the police of the abbasid dynasty he ordered that imam abu musir be grabbed by his legs and be dragged and he was thrown in the most Uh, tight of the jail cells in the most smallest and the tightest of the dungeons of the jail jail cells fama aqama bihi illa yasiran hatta tuwfiya rahimahullah and he could not bear that punishment except for a few days as we mentioned almost 100 days until he passed away under this 
uh, oppression and punishment. Uh, may Allah have mercy on him. Rahimahullah. فَحَدَرَ جَنَازَتَهُ مِنَ الْخَلْقِ مَا لَا يُحْسِهِ إِلَّا اللَّهِ That after this, his janaza, his prayer for his janaza that occurred, such a large number of people attended his janaza that one could not have enumerated them. One could not have even enumerated them. Imam Abu Dawood al-Sijistani, Rahimullah, the author of the great book as sunan he says, كَانَ مِنْ ثِقَاتِ النَّاسِ رَحِمَ اللَّهِ أَبَا مُسْهِرْ لَقَدْ كَانَ مِنَ الْإِسْلَامِ بِمَكَانٍ حُمِلَ عَلَى الْمِحْنَ فَأَبَا وَحُمِلَ عَلَى السَّيْفِ فَمَدَّ رَاسَهُ وَجُرِّدَ السَّيْفِ فَأَبَا فَلَمَّا رَوُوا ذَلِكَ مِنْهُ حُمِلَ إِلَى السِّجْنِ فَمَاتَ Imam Abu Dawood, he says, he was the, <coughs> from the people who had the utmost trust in Allah Azza wa Jal. May Allah have mercy upon the great Imam Abu Mushir. He was from the foremost scholars of Islam. He was forced and he was trialed and tested so he was patient and he was placed upon the sword so he extended his neck to be a sacrifice upon the correct belief and the sword was unsheathed in front of him and he was still patient and when they saw this from him his unwavering belief and his strength in his creed then they entered him into the jail cells and the dungeons until they uh, until he passed away rahimahullah then we'll move on to his creed etiqad and aqidah and his uh, warning from the people of innovation and misguidance and we'll just suffice with this aspect of his creed for which he was extremely tested and trial and that was the cause of his death. Imam Abu Musir rahimahullah, he says, مَا أَدْرَكْنَا أَحَدًا مِنْ أَهْلِ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا وَهُوَ يَقُولْ الْقُرْآنُ كَلَامُ اللَّهِ غَيْرُ مَخْلُوقِ He says that I did not meet any from my scholars, from the great scholars of the Salaf and the Ahlul Hadith, Ahlul Sunnah, from the great scholars of the Atba'u Tabi'een and other than them, they were all unified and united in this statement that the Qur'an is the Kalamullah, the speech of Allah, it is not created. It is not created. Then we'll move on to his ittiba, his methodology in jurisprudence, and him following unconditionally the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu Imam Ibn Mufarraj he says, wa Abu Mushir Sayyidu ahl sham wa faqihihim wa abidihim. That Imam Abu Mushir he is from the leaders of the area of Sham, the Muslims of Sham, and he is from the foremost of their jurists of their fuqaha. He's a faqih, the foremost of the jurists of Sham, and he's from the foremost of the worshippers of Allah in the region, in the region of Sham. <laughs> Imam Abu Musir, rahimahullah, he says, Jalastu Sa'id ibn Abdul Aziz, thin tay asharat asana, wa ma kana ahadun min ashabi ahfadha li hadithi minni. And we mentioned that this great Imam, his, his mention will come soon. When we mention that from the teachers and shiyukh of Imam Abu Musir is Sa'id ibn Abdul Aziz at Tanukhi. Sa'id ibn Abdul Aziz at Tanukhi. He says regarding this teacher and scholar that he says, Imam Abu, Abu Musir, that I spent 12 years, 12 long years in the company of my sheikh and teacher Sa'id ibn Abdul Aziz at Tanukhi. Sa'id ibn Abdul Aziz at Tanukhi, learning hadith from him, <coughs> and learning fiqh and jurisprudence from him learning hadith and fiqh and jurisprudence from this great imam from the Ahlul Hadith. And he said that no one from my companions, from the students of Imam Sa'id bin Abdulaziz Tanukhi was, had memorized more from him, had memorized more from him than me, had benefited and memorized more from him than me. And who is Sa'id bin Abdulaziz at Tanukhi? Who is Sa'id? And it might be a name that many of our uh, listeners and people who are present have not heard. Imam Sa'id ibn Abdul Aziz at Tanukhi, he is a Dimashqi from the city of Damascus, the capital of Syria, from the same city of Imam Abu Mushir. And he was from the major Atba'u Tabi'een, from the major Atba'u Tabi'een. He was from the, from the major Imams of the Muslims. He is a Thiqa, the foremost memorizer and reliable, trustworthy narrator of Hadith, and he is the Mufti of Dimashq wa Alimuha. The Mufti, the Mufti of the city of Damascus and his scholar, Faqih Ahl al-Sham Badal Awza'i. He is the 
foremost jurist of the region of Sham after the great Imam, Imam al Awza'i. The great Imam, Imam al Awza'i. Imam Ahmad, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Rahimahullah. He says, Huwa wal Awza'i indi sawa. That Imam Sa'id ibn Abdul Aziz at Tanukhi and Imam al Awza'i near me are of the same level, are of the same level. This is a great praise from Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal from the foremost muhaddithin and the fuqaha of this of the Islamic nation regarding these two great muhaddithin and fuqaha Imam Sa'id bin Abdul Aziz Al-Tanukhi and Imam Al-Awza'i Imam Al-Hakim he says huwa li ahl al-Sham ka malikin li ahl al-Madina fi taqaddum wal fiqh wal fadl that Imam Sa'id bin Abdul Aziz Al-Tanukhi he is in the region of Sham similar to Imam Malik in the region of Medina similar to Imam Malik in the region of Medina in relation to their to the level they reached in their knowledge and in the knowledge of fiqh in the knowledge of the jurisprudence of Islam and in their virtue and nobility in their virtue of nobility Abu Ishaq al-Shirazi he said وَثَبَتَ الْفَتْوَى بِالشَّامْ عَلَى مَذْهَبَ الْأَوْزَاعِ وَسَعِيدْ بِنْ عَبْدَ الْأَزِيزِ وَسَعِيدْ بِنْ عَبْدَ الْأَزِيزِ that the people of Sham in those times then they used to follow and benefit the so, uh, benefit regarding the Sunnah and the Ahadith of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, from the statements and the positions and the fatawa and the madhab of Imam al awzai and Sa'id bin Abdul Aziz at Tanukhi. Sa'id bin Abdul Aziz at Tanukhi. We mentioned this showing again that these were great jurists of Islam that preceded the four Imams that the people have blindly followed and restricted and confined themselves to. Deeming that these are the only four schools of thought in Islam and they are the only four jurists of Islam and even anyone who exists from them and their schools of thought then he has deviated and misguided. These are Imams that preceded them. Imam Ahmad we just mentioned whose madhab is blindly followed by the Hanbalis. They confine and restrict themselves to the books of this madhab and he himself is saying that from the great scholars uh, of Islam is Imam al awzai and Imam Sa'id ibn Abdul Aziz at Tanukh praising them for the knowledge in hadith and the knowledge in fiqh and jurisprudence. So Imam Abu Mushir, who was one of the foremost students of this great Imam, Sayyid bin Abdul Aziz at Tanukhi, who stayed with him for 12 years learning from him, he reached the pinnacle in the science of hadith and in the science of fiqh and jurisprudence. He was upon the methodology of Imam Sayyid bin Abdul Aziz, who was upon the methodology of Imam al awzai following the methodology of Ahlul Hadith and jurisprudence. Following the methodology of the Ahlul Hadith and jurisprudence. Imam Abu Mushir, Rahimullah, he says, Qala li Sa'id ibn Abdul Aziz, Ma ra'aytu ahsana mas'alatan minka ba'da Suleiman ibn Musa. That Imam Sa'id ibn Abdul Aziz al-Tanukhi praised his student, Imam Abu Mushir, for the level he has reached in fiqh, in jurisprudence, by saying that I have not met any person who was better in researching matters of fiqh, researching uh, rulings pertaining to acts of worship than you, O Abu Mus Mushir, after Suleiman ibn Musa, after the great Imam Suleiman ibn Musa Dimishqi al-Ashdaq. Suleiman ibn Musa Dimishqi al-Ashdaq, who was the great jurist and the mufti of Damascus in his time. He is from the junior tabi'een, from the junior tabi'een. So this was the methodology of Imam Abu Mushir in jurisprudence in which he is upon the methodology of his teacher Sa'id bin Abdul Aziz at Tanukhi who is upon the methodology of his teacher and companion Imam al awzai they are all upon the methodology of the Ahlul Hadith then we'll move on to some of the statements of this great Imam Imam Abu Mushir from the statements is that qila li Abu Mushir fi rajul yusahhif wa yukhti wa yahim fil hadith faqala bayyan amrahu فَقِيلَ لَهُ أَذَلِكَ عَيْبْ قَالَ لَا That it was asked to Imam Abu Mushir regarding a narrator of hadith, a person who makes mistakes in his narration of hadith. He makes mistakes and errors and he distorts the words, changes the words. Is it permissible for a person to make clear his affair and to disparage him and to criticize this narrator to, sh to tell the people that he is a weak narrator and his hadith is to be rejected. So Imam Abu Musir, rahimahullah, he says, Bayyan amrahu, 
then clarify his affair. Clarify his affair to the people. Let the people know that he makes errors and mistakes in narration of hadith and that his hadith is not to be accepted. فَقِيلَ لَهُ أَزَالِكَ عَيْب So it was asked, is that not something that is considered backbiting? Is it not something that, is it not considered backbiting? فَقَالَ لَا That no. This is from advice to the Muslims. We have mentioned in our previous classes that the science of Jarwa Ta'adil, of criticizing and praising narrators, it is from the greatest of sciences by which the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu has been saved and preserved until our times and remain until the end of times. And the scholars have unanimously agreed that criticizing and praising the narrators of hadith, then this is not backbiting. This is not backbiting, rather this is from the obligatory matters in giving advice to the Muslims and saving the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu from distortions and errors and mistakes. Imam Ibn Hibban, rahimahullah, he says, وَكَانَ إِمَامَ أَهْلِ الشَّامِ فِي الْحِفْظِ وَالْإِتْقَانِ مِمَّا عَنَا بِأَنْسَابْ أَهْلِ بَلَدِهِ وَأَنْبَائِهِمْ وَإِلَيْهِ كَانَ يَرْجَ أَهْلُ الشَّامِ فِي الْجَرْحِ وَالتَّعْدِيلِ لِشِيُوخِهِمْ Imam Ibn Hibban, he says regarding Imam Ibn Abu Musher, that he was the Imam of the region of Sham in precise, accurate memorization of the hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he gave due diligence and reached high levels in knowing the biographies of the narrators of hadith of his region in compiling and memorizing and preserving the biographies of the narrators of hadith and to him used to return the people of sham the scholars of sham eh, to know the praise and praise and criticism of the narrators of hadith in sham the people the scholars of sham used to refer back to him consider him a reference point to rule upon the narrators of Sham, praising and criticizing them, whose hadith is to be accepted and whose hadith is to be rejected. And Imam Ibn Nabi Hatim al Razi, in this great book, Taqdimatul Marifa, he has mentioned a chapter in his biography that is Babu, Ma Zukira min Kalam Abi Mushir, fi naqilatil akhbar wa kunahum wa asma'im. Chapter in which he has narrated the statements of Imam Abu Mushir that shows his great status and the high level he reached in knowing the narrators of hadith, knowing details and detailed matters regarding the narrators of hadith and criticizing them and praising them and his knowledge about their names and their kunyas and differentiating between two narrators and everything that pertains to this knowledge of Ilm al rijal and Jarwa Ta'adil. And he has mentioned several examples in this chapter that uh, one can refer back to. Imam Ibn Abi Hatim, he says in this book, Taqdimatul Marifa, Sa'altu Abi an Abi Mushir, Faqala Thiqa, Ma ra'aytu afsah minhu mimman katabna anhu. That he says, I asked my father, the great Imam Abu Hatim al Razi, regarding Imam Abu Mushir. So he said he was Thiqa, he was the utmost reliable, trustworthy narrator of the hadith of Prophet Muhammad. Then he, then he mentions another aspect of his life and his him reaching the highest level in another branch of knowledge and another science of Islam, he says, I did not see anyone who was more proficient in the Arabic language than him from the scholars that we heard and wrote hadith from. From the vast scholars that Imam Abu Hatim heard and wrote, wrote and learned hadith from, he said, I did not see anyone who was more, uh, who reached a higher level in the sciences of the Arabic language and proficiency in the Arabic language. And this is shown in the great prose and poems that are narrated on this great Imam Abu Musher. On this great Imam Abu Musher. Imam al Zuhli, Muhammad ibn Yahya al Zuhli, he says, Sameetu Abu Musher in Yunshid, Wala khaira fi dunya liman lam yakun lahu, Min Allahi fi dar al Muqami nasibu. Fain tu'jibu al dunya rijalan fa innahu, Mata'un qalilun wa zawalu qaribu. Imam Al-Zuhli, he says that I heard Imam Abu Mushir mentioning these two lines of poetry that there is no goodness in this worldly life for the person who does not work towards the afterlife. There is no goodness in this worldly life for a person who has no share 
near Allah Azza wa Jal in, in paradise in the afterlife. Then he says that if this worldly life has, has deluded some people, some people who are deficient in their intellect and they have, they have been deluded by this short worldly life, he says, for really this worldly life, it is a brief enjoyment. It is a brief enjoyment and it is something that will end soon. It is something that will end soon. Ibn Dayzil, he says, Sameetu Aba Musheran Yunshid, Habka Ummirta Misla Ma Asha Nuhun, Thumma La Qayta Kulla Zaka Yasara, Hal Min Al Mauti La Abalaka Buddun, Ayu Hayin Ila Siwa Al Mauti Sara. That Imam Abu Musher mentioned these two lines of poetry. He said that. Imagine, let us suppose, let us imagine that you live for the period, time period that Nuh salam lived for. And how long did he live for? 950 years. 950 years. He's saying that imagine, let us imagine that you live for the same time period that Nuh salam lived, which is 950 years. But you will find that all of, us, all of that was something of little value. It went by quickly. It went by quickly. Hal min al mauti la abalaka buddun. No matter how long you live, can you escape death? Can anyone escape and run away from death? Death is to come, there is no running away from it. Ayyu hayyin ila siwal mauti sara. Whoever is alive, what, does he, what is he going towards except death? Except, except that he is going towards his death and uh, leaving this short, worldly, uh, temporary life. Abdul Baqi ibn al Hassan, he says, Sala Aba Mushirin, Rajulun, and Mas'alatin, Falam Yujibhu, Thumma Ada Ale, Falam Yujibhu, Thumma Ada Ale, Falam Yujibhu. That Abdul Baqi ibn al Hassan, he says that one person, he asked Imam Abu Musir regarding a matter, he asked him a question. So Imam Abu Musir did not answer him. So that person repeated that question. So Imam Abu Musir again did not answer him. He repeated the question a third time. So he again did not answer him. فَقِيلَ لَهُ فِي ذَلِكَ فَقَالَ سَمِعْتُ مَالِكًا يَقُولُ مِنْ أَذَالَةِ مِنْ إِذَالَةِ الْعِلْمِ أَنْ تُجِيبَ كُلَّ مَنْ سَأَلَكَ So when he was told to him, you are from the Imams of the Muslims in our times in the area of Sham. Why did you not answer this person regarding the matter he asked you, the question he posed to you? So he says, I heard my sheikh and teacher Imam Malik saying that lowering knowledge and disrespecting knowledge is by answering everyone who ans asks you. Answering every question that you ask. Every question that a person is asked, then a person who answers every single question that he is asked, then this is from diminishing and disrespecting knowledge. Dimin diminishing and disrespecting uh, knowledge. A person might ask questions that, that might not be at the level of the questioner. If he answers those, qu answers, if he answers those questions, it might cause a trial and tribulation for the questioner. He might not understand them properly. He might not take the answer properly. So it is not proper that a person of knowledge answers every single question that he is possessed. Some of the questions are questions regarding matters that have not occurred, that are far from reality, that might never occur. Questions regarding intricate, detailed parts of, of, of some matters that are of less or no benefit. So such questions are to be shunned. And a person who dwells into these questions and answers them, answers every question regarding them, then he's in reality decreasing and diminishing and dis dis disrespecting the knowledge that he has been given. Then we'll finish with the death of this great Imam, Imam Abu Mushir, Rahimahullah. Abu Hassan al Ziyadi, he said, Mata Abu Mushir fi Rajab, Sanat, Saman, Ashara wa Miyatain. That Imam Abu Musa, he passed away in the month of Rajab, in the year 218, 218. And Imam Ibn Sa'd, Rahimullah, he says, Mata arbi'a mustahal Rajab. That he passed away on the, on the day of Wednesday, the day of Wednesday, the first of Rajab, the first day of Rajab in the year 218. 
and we just mentioned the detailed um, incident and the trial and tribulation he went through with Mamun and the misguided, deviated sect of the Mu'tazila that were a cause for his death, where he passed away in the city of Baghdad, in the jail and the dungeons of the Abbasid dynasty, uh, after spending 100 days or approximately of his life under that severe trial and test. And he lived for a period of 78 years. We said he was born in the year 140 after the Hijrah, passing away in the year 218. So he lived for a period of 78 years. Rahimallah, uh, Al-Imam Aba Mushir, wa azzahu anna, wa anil muslimina khair al jaza wa askanahu fasi jannati. If there are any questions, then we can address them, inshallah. These deviated sects, especially the Mu'tazila and the Jahmiya and their offshoots, then they have based their beliefs upon, upon intellect and ilmul kalam and rhetoric and Greek philosophy, etc. They have accepted these beliefs from, from the disbelievers, from the Greek philosophers and the people of rhetoric and other than them. And they have caused them to go far away astray in these beliefs. In these beliefs. So the Quran near them, it is not held in the same regard that it is held near Ahlul Sunnah, Ahlul Hadith, the safe sect, the aided group that Allah Ta'ala has ordered the Muslims to rule with the Quran and re return back to the Quran in all matters of life. Near these people, the Quran, as we mentioned, it is, it is created. It is not the speech of Allah, Azza wa Jal. And their Greek philosophy and rhetoric, that is what takes precedence over over uh, the Quran, over the Quran. And this, as we mentioned, is a belief of kufr, of disbelief. And the scholars have unified in, in deeming that the one who deems the Quran to be created, not an attribute, a speech of Allah Azza wa then he has disbelieved. Then he has disbelieved uh, in the Quran. No. When they say that it is created, they consider it as created by Allah. They consider it not to be the speech of Allah Azza wa Jal. They consider it not to be the speech of Allah Azza wa Jal. And they consider it to be created just like the remaining creation of Allah Azza wa Jal. The Creator has created everything that exists. Allah Ta'ala has created everything that exists. Allah Ta'ala has attributes. Allah Ta'ala has names and attributes. From his attributes is that Allah Ta'ala, he sees and he speaks and he hears. As has come in the Quran and the Sunnah, Allah Ta'ala is a sami he hears. Allah Ta'ala is al-basir, he sees. Allah Ta'ala speaks. These Mu'tazila Jahmiya, they deem these attributes to be the same attributes as the creation. They link these attributes to the attributes of the creation. That if Allah Ta'ala is describing himself with being, with, with being that he speaks and he sees and he hears, then we, the humans, also speak. We also hear. We also see. So this misguidance led them to negate these attributes that Allah Ta'ala does not speak. He does not see. He does not hear. He has no attributes. To the point that we mentioned in our previous classes, the Salaf, the ulama of the Salaf, they mentioned that the Mu'tazila Jahmiya, they believe or they worship a Lord that does not exist. They worship a Lord that does not exist. He, near him, he has no attributes. Allah Ta'ala, Lord of the heavens and the earth, they, he has no attributes. He does not exist. He does not exist. So, the Creator, he has attributes that he has informed us in his speech in his revelation in the Quran and in the Sunnah that the Prophet ﷺ has informed us of and it is obligatory upon the Muslims to believe in these attributes according to their apparent meanings according to their apparent meanings and believe that Laysa ka shay that Allah Ta'ala speaks, he, sees, he hears, he sees but his speech 
and his hearing and his uh, seeing is not like the speech and the hearing and uh, the the uh, uh, and the listening of any anything else uh, nothing re resembles it there's no resemblance to it there's no resemblance to it The Ashaira, they came into existence much after the Jahmi and the Mu'tazila. As we just mentioned, the Mu'tazila, they came into existence at the time of the Tabi'een, at the time of the Tabi'een. And then the offshoot, uh, Jahmiya, they also, uh, Jaham bin Safwan came immediately after, <coughs> at the end of the Tabi'een, at the Bawah Tabi'een. The Ashaira, they took some beliefs of various groups and sects that preceded them. And Abu al-Hasan al-Ashari, he made this creed and he also went towards various levels and stages in his life. He was firstly upon the creed of the Jahmiya Mu'tazila, then he adopted the creed of the Kullabiya, which was also a sect, a misguided sect. Then he uh, presented this creed of al uh, 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 that is attributed to him today, the Ashari creed. Then at near the end of his life, he recanted and he returned back to the creed of Ahlul Sunnah, of Ahlul Hadith, in which he wrote his book, Alibana, which is well known and amongst us. So the creed that is attributed to him is the creed in which he has did ta'wil. He has did ta'wil, misinterpretation of all of the attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal, except seven attributes. Seven attributes, they affirm according to their apparent meanings because they claim that without these attributes uh, or in these attributes, there's no tashbih, there's no re resemblance to the creation. But the other attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal, other than these seven attributes, they make ta'wil off. They make away their meanings and they distort them and they misinterpret them to run away and avoid tashbih that they claim that Affirming these attributes creates the resemblance with the crea creation. Resemblance with the creation. And the scholars, since this belief has come into existence, have ruled upon them to be an uh, innovated, misguided belief. And this creed to be a creed in opposition and contradiction to the creed of the Salaf. The creed of the Ahlul Hadith and the Salaf. As far as the people today or people claiming that they are just a school of thought or a mazhab, then without a doubt this is extreme leniency and this claim is a deviated claim. The Asharis are misguided, they are people of innovation, their creed is, is in contradiction, opposition to the creed of all of the Imams of the Salaf, the Imams of Ahlul Hadith, Ahlul Sunnah. And the scholars, they have differentiated themselves, them from the Mu'tazila and the Jahmiya, without a doubt. The Jahmiya and the Mu'tazila, as we just mentioned, all of the scholars have unanimously said that they are kuffar, they are disbelievers. Because they negate every single attribute of Allah Azza wa Jal. They do not affirm any attribute to Allah Azza wa Jal. They negate every attribute. The Ash'aris, as we just mentioned, they affirm seven attributes and they distort the meanings of the remaining attributes. So the scholars of Islam, they do not rule upon them with the same ruling as the Jahmi and the Mu'tazila to be kuffar, to be disbelievers, to be disbelievers. But without a doubt, this is a misguided, deviant belief that none of the scholars of the Salaf from the Sahaba, from the Tabi'een, from the Atba'ud Tabi'een, these great Imams of Islam were upon. And their creed has opposed the Quran and the Sunnah and the Ijma of the Muslims and the and the aqeedah and the creed of the salaf without a doubt. Are there any other questions? 
If there are no questions, we'll end our session here, inshallah. Wallahu ta'ala alam wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam atasliman kathira. وذكر فإن الذكرى تنفع المؤمنين وما خلقت الجن والإنس إلا ليعبدون